So this is um, our second community lecture um, focused on GI cancers. The topic of tonight's lectures uh, is colon cancer and impact of diet. Um, my name is Laura Martella Rooney. I am uh, the moderator for tonight's event. I'm director of GI research at SUNY Downstate. And tonight we have uh, two speakers. One, uh, Sam Mole, who is a registered dietitian nutritionist at SUNY Downstate, and Mohammed Al Magdadi, one of our third year GI fellows uh, in my division of gastroenterology. And this uh, lecture series is sponsored by Cold Spring Harbor and Laboratory and Northwell Health. And of course, special thanks uh, to my partners in crime, Pamela Straker, Lakia Maxwell from the Brooklyn Health Disparity Center, and Betty Young from the Center for Community Health Promotion and Wellness. I just wanted to um, make uh, a little plug for our upcoming seventh annual Cancer Health Disparity Symposium. Uh, which community members are more than welcome to attend. Our next one is scheduled for Friday, March 4th, 2022. Um, we have our keynote speaker, Edith Mitchell from Thomas Jefferson University. And then we have sessions on colon cancer, pancreatic cancer, and our third session on cancer and comorbidities, modifiable factors. So let me go ahead and introduce our first speaker. Um, is Sam Mull. He got his BA at the University of California, Santa Cruz, and then went on to receive his master's degree in nutrition at Hunter College. And as I said, he is a registered dietitian nutritionist. And he's going to give us information uh, related to impact of diet on colon cancer. Okay, Sam, if you want to share your slides. Sure thing, Laura. All right, here we go. Alrighty, and uh, the floor is mine? The floor, floor is yours. All right. So we are talking about colon cancer and the impact of diet. So what is a good diet to eat? What are the foods we want to focus on to, to help us prevent colon cancer? And so Laura said all these things about me. Um, the last plug that I will give for myself is that I'm also a mindfulness instructor. Um, I lead classes at SUNY Downstate. Um, so I lead classes for um, the physician residents and for the um, kitchen staff at the hospital. Um, so that's been a really fun um, extra part of my job. Um, if you have any questions about, about that and how you could uh, try that out, um, I love talking about it. So let's just, um, under we're talking about colon cancer. So what is the colon? So this, um, if we look at the picture on the right, the colon is the kind of the, the big outline around that's going, you know, all the way around there. Um, it's also known as the large intestine or the large bowel. Um, and the colon is almost at the end of our digestive tract. So. After the colon, we have the rectum where our waste is stored, and then the anus where um, our waste products are um, kind of their last step before they, they, um, they, they go into the toilet. And one last thing on this picture, um, we have the colon and then inside of it, that's the small intestine. All those kind of squiggles is the small intestine, which if we um, you know, stretched all that out, it would be very, very long. And I will um, you know, get into that on our next slide. So um, what does the colon do? Um, we are 
talking about um so we're gonna go on a little journey for what happens when we eat food all right you guys ready for a little road trip get your shoes on you might you don't need a mask for this so let's say we eat um you know it's fall let's say we're, we're gonna have some split pea soup and we we put that soup into our mouth and there's some chunks of carrots and potatoes in it so we're we're going to do a little chewing to, to break it down. Um, we have some enzymes that are going to break down the sugars there. And we're going to swallow that food. It's going to go past our throat, our esophagus, and into our stomach. Our stomach is pretty acidic, so it's going to break that food down and turn it all into, you know, a uniform texture. All right. Um, we're not really going to absorb much uh, nutrients um, or calories or macronutrients from the stomach, but it's going to then uh, go into the small intestine, which is all those, those pink squiggles that we see on our friend here. Um, and this is the site of where our nutrient, most of our nutrients are absorbed. So most of the carbohydrates, the proteins, the fats, what we call the macronutrients, what are, you know, providing the fuel, building our cells, providing insulation, they're being absorbed here in the small intestine, as well as our micronutrients. So most of our um, vitamins and mineral. So it's, there's a lot going on here. And then so most of the nutrient content it is, is absorbed in the small intestine. So by the time it gets over to the colon, you know, over here near the appendix, it's kind of just like a, a wet slurry. And in the colon, the big thing that's happening is the water that is, that is accompanying that is starting to be reabsorbed into our body. You know, our body's made mostly of water. Um, and it wants to hold on to that. It has a lot of important jobs to do. So the colon is going to reabsorb the water and some nutrients, and it's going to kind of start to form our stool, our number two, our poop. Um, and also in our large intestine is where um, a large percentage of our microbiome is. So the mostly bacteria that provide all these important functions to keep us healthy. And you know what, what goes into the colon is, is also the food source. You know, those bacteria, they just like us, they gotta eat. Um, and they get their, their nutrition um, from whatever we're putting into the colon. And we'll get into what is, you know, what those bacteria love to eat in just a minute. So by the time our um, waste leaves the colon, um, it's going to go to the rectum. And that's kind of like where, where we are, our poop stores until it's, um, you know, secreted into the, you know, the toilet bowl. Right. So that was our journey into the di digestive system. And I hope you have a little bit better idea about, you know, what, what happens when we eat food and specifically the colon. And so we're going to get into the meat or the fiber, the heart of the, the, the conversation about what does a healthy dietary pattern to prevent colon cancer look like. And according to the American Cancer Society, research shows that habits, so our choices related to diet, weight, and exercise are strongly linked to colorectal cancer. You know, we're, we're and the colorectal, that just extends the colon to all the way down to the rectum. Um, and so, so what that tells us, what the American Cancer Society is telling us is that what we put into our body really has a big effect on our, you know, our, our risk of colon cancer. And so, and, and not only our diet, but um, the amount of exercise we're doing 
if we are in a healthy weight for us. And so the dietary pattern that we really want to focus on is full of fruits, vegetables, whole grains, beans, legumes, and low fat dairy. And, you know, in this list, we don't have, um, you know, meats like uh, chicken, pork, beef uh, listed here, or things like eggs. Um, they, those can certainly be part of your diet and we can still be healthy, but the dietary pattern that has shown to be, you know, preventative to decrease our risk of colon cancer is focused on these things listed here. And what all of these foods, except the low fat dairy have in common is fiber. So fiber only comes from plants. So if you are eating any sort of meat or eggs or dairy, there will be no fiber in that food. And fiber is so important um, and most of us are not getting enough. Actually, 95% of Americans, that's children and adults, are not getting enough fiber. And so about how much fiber um, do we need to eat? It's um, estimated to be about 14 grams of fiber per, per 1,000 calories consumed. So that would be about 25 grams of fiber for women, 38 grams of fiber per man. And often people, um, it's, it's common to associate fiber with, you know, feelings of, of gassiness, flatulence. Um, and that's, only, that's common if you, you're following, you know, you have a low fiber diet, you know, as most Americans do, and you go ahead and go eat and consume a large amount of beans, uh, cruciferous vegetables like broccoli and kale. So when we talk about you know, eating fiber and increasing our intake of it, we, we really recommend doing it gradually, right? It's so important that we get fiber, but for our body to adjust to the change, we want to slowly eat a little bit more fiber. And so in this picture here, we have, um, you know, the content of some popular foods. Um, one that I want to point out that I think, you know, it really surprised me when I first uh, saw the fiber content of it. And I think for a lot of people is avocados. You know, there can be up to 13 grams of fiber in one avocado. That's significant. You know, that's for, for women, that's, that's, uh, half of the calories that that they need, half of the, um, the fiber intake that they they need to consume, and we have some other you know list fiber content listed, and really the biggest bang for our buck on fiber are legumes. So that is black beans, chickpeas, split peas, and lentils as listed here they are so high in fiber. Um, and these are great because they are all, they're, they're pretty shelf stable, right? So we can buy cans of beans, we can buy dried beans, we can buy frozen uh, uh, things like peas, which are a type of uh, like a fresh legume. Um, so that is such a great way to, to boost your fiber intake. And when we talk about fiber for prevention of colon cancer, this is also, you know, what's recommended, you know, fiber, increasing our fiber intake is just a general benefit to us, right? So it's not just we need to eat more fiber if we want to prevent colon cancer. Eating more fiber, you know, is, has, a, has a whole bunch of other benefits that, that I'll get to next. And so we have two types of fiber. The first is soluble fiber. So that means it is soluble in water. So if you put, you know, some uh, sweet potato or some of that avocado in, in water as it does in our bodies, it's going to dissolve into a gel-like substance. 
All right. Um, so we have some common, you know, some some uh, soluble fibers listed here. And the benefit of soluble fiber is that it can lower total and LDL cholesterol. So fiber, if, if you have any sort of cardiovascular disease, um, high blood pressure, um, increasing your fiber intake, especially with soluble fiber, has a lot of benefits, right? Because that fiber, that soluble fiber is like a sponge. So it can absorb some of the cholesterol and then it just gets um, excreted in our stool. And soluble fiber also can help manage our blood sugar. So when we, you know, eat, eat a mixed meal um, and we have fiber in it, it's going to delay the absorption of that sugar into our bloodstream. So it's going to prevent that spike in blood sugar that we get when we just drink juice um, or really consume any, any like high sugar uh, food or beverage. Um, and there is a link between heart disease and diabetes and colon cancer. So with fiber, we, we can help um, underlying conditions like heart disease and diabetes um, and issues with um, related to preventing colon cancer. Next up, we have insoluble fiber, meaning that when in water, it does not dissolve, it stays intact. Um, it's, it's kind of the fiber that we'll call roughage. And it acts as um, an analogy I really love to talk about insoluble fiber is when it gets to the colon, it's like a broom, you know, because it stays in, intact and it just tidies up, you know, our colon sweeping, you know, whatever, whatever kind of leftover uh, foods um, that, that we have hanging out in there. And it can add bulk to our stool. So, for if if constipation is a um, something that you have an issue with, um, or just to prevent it, insoluble fiber um, can be really helpful, and just to to promote regular bowel movements. And with it, it can be challenging to separate soluble and insoluble because most foods contain both. You know, like if we take the apple, for example, which is in the insoluble category, the peel of the apple is going to be much higher in insoluble fiber, but then the center you know, of the apple, the, the white part, is going to be higher in soluble. So if it feels a little um, overwhelming, like am I eating soluble or am I eating insoluble? just trying to increase your fiber intake in general is really beneficial for colon cancer prevention, as well as managing diabetes and heart disease. And fiber, as we were talking about, um, when we were talking about the bacteria in our colon, they are able to, um, th this, the fiber is the food source, um, one of the food sources for our bacteria. Um, so we really, by eating fiber, we are, you know, feeding, feeding those, those good bacteria that, that really are really important for a healthy body. And so how do we know what the fiber content is of a food? So if we have a, this is a example, nutrition facts label. Um, let's say it's for, this is maybe for lentils. And a one cup serving of lentils has five grams of fiber. So we look underneath the total carbohydrates, which is 10 grams. Um, and the dietary fiber is five grams. So half the carbohydrates are coming from dietary fiber. So if you are a diabetic and you are looking at this, um, the net carbs in this nutrition fact label would be three grams. Um, or it would be, no, it would still be five grams. Um, so the dietary fiber um, is not counted towards kind of our grams That's because it's not gonna cause an increase in our, um, in our blood sugar because it's, it's non-digestible. And so we're talking about eating more vegetables, fruits, grains, dairy, um, and proper portionings of our proteins. 
So um, a common way to think about it is a plate. You know, a plate is a big circle and we want to divide our food where we have um, vegetables, fruits, a grain or a starch and a protein serving. Um, especially in a Western diet, it's very common for our portion of protein, so our chicken, beef, pork, fish, to, to really take up a large uh, portion of the plate, right? So they're taking up much more than a quarter of the plate that's recommended. Um, so really recommend to, to increase the intake of vegetables. So that would be two to three cups a day and fruits, one and a half to two cups. For grains, five to eight ounces of grains a day. So eight ounces is one cup um, and uh, three cups of dairy. And it is recommended for fat-free or low fat. And for protein foods, um, five to six and a half ounces. So that is, you know, a, a deck of cards is about um, a three to four ounce serving, depending on. So you can think about maybe like um, a deck of cards and a half as a protein serving, um, which may seem like a small amount. But if you're, you know, if you're eating more of the other categories and you're more likely to feel satisfied. And all those, the vegetables, the fruits, the grains, the beans, they are great, source, great sources of fiber, which really help to provide um, a feeling of satiety, right? So satiety means of satisfied. We don't eat it and you know, digest it right away like we would with um, you know, like a, um, a processed cookie or chips. It, that, um, it, that bulkening of it, of soluble and insoluble fiber, you know, helps us stay um, full for longer. And so now we, we talked about what we, um, you know, we should be doing uh, to prevent colon cancer, but, and now we're just gonna go into um, a little bit of what we should try to minimize um, to, to reduce our risk of colon cancer. And the first one, oops, the first one and the, the main one is a diet high in red, processed or charred meats. So it's mostly when we talk about red meat, we're mostly talking about beef. Um, so limiting our intake of beef can be supportive. And that doesn't mean that we are not eating any meat. You can still enjoy a burger in moderation, um, but just making sure that um, we're, you know, we're, we're moderating that intake. Um, and processed meats, we can think about things like lunch meats, hot dogs, um, the, 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 um, the chemicals that are used to preserve those meats, um, they've been known to be carcinogenic and can, can promote um, colon cancer. And also charred meats, the, the charring of the meat has also um, it, you know, been shown to be a little bit uh, carcinogenic. Um, so a lack of exercise can contribute. So that means exercise. Um, you know, there, there's no definition of, of what exercise. It's, it's up to your body, what you enjoy, what brings you pleasure, um, what, what you have access to. Um, you know, especially with COVID going on, being able to get out and have some space and go on a walk, especially before winter comes and it gets too cold. Um, obesity is a risk factor, um, especially with fat around the abdominal area. Uh, smoking can increase our risk for colon cancer as well as alcohol abuse. So, you know, all of these things, you know, if, if you are, if these are things that um, you partake in, to really moderate your consumption of them. Um, and before I end, the, the one thing I'm going to go back to is the, you know, this dietary pattern. And I just wanted to speak again to, to it's a dietary pattern is, is something that we talk a lot about in nutrition. And it's, it's kind of, if you take an average of what you're eating over a week, that there's going to be, you know, those fruits, veggies, grains, and beans in there. It doesn't mean that you can't enjoy 
um, ice cream and dessert and chips and things that you like. You know, food is really a source of pleasure. And when we when we put foods on the, you know, the no list, I can't touch that, it often leads to, um, you know, some serious cravings. Um, it can lead to some disordered eating. Uh, so just trying to make sure you're hitting all the food groups that are important and then enjoying those other foods in moderation. And that is all I have for everyone. Those are my references from the presentation. And I'm going to stop sharing my screen and would be happy to answer any questions. So Sam, um, I'll ask the first question. And if anyone, any other participants have a question for Sam, please put it in the chat and we will ask it of him. So Sam, my question to you is regarding the fresh versus frozen um, for fruits and vegetables. You know, is one better over the other? Or if you only have access to frozen, you know, do you get the same nutritional value from, from frozen vegetables, say? Yeah, that is a great question, Laura. Um, so often there, it depends, but with frozen fruits and vegetables, they are often um, frozen soon after they're harvested. So they're frozen at, you know, their peak nutrient content. So at often frozen fruits and vegetables will have a higher nutrient content than, than the fruits and veggies that are on our grocery store shelf and have been sitting there for who knows how long and they were grown in Chile, Mexico, California. So they had to be harvested, transported. Um, and in that time period, there's nutrient loss. Um, so, and the great thing about, about frozen fruits and vegetables, about, about having them, um, cert certain canned products, is that they're, they're really, they're, um, they're ready to go. You know, you don't have to worry about them spoiling. You can just take them out, um, especially in the winter when we're eating more hot foods, more soups, um, frozen, you know, things like spinach and kale and green peas um, seem to kind of go in a little more meals. Great, Thanks for the question. thank you. Are there any questions in the chat? No questions. If anyone has questions, please feel free to put it in the chat and we will share it with um, the presenter. Okay, what are your thoughts on protein shakes, vitamin shakes and daily vitamins? This is a question from Amber. Yes, that is a great question, Amber. Thank you so much for asking it. Um, so, I like to take a food first approach. So getting my, getting the, our nutrition from, you know, from fresh frozen foods. Um, but sometimes that, that can be difficult uh, because of being able to access them, having busy lives. Um, and so that is when things like, um, as you said, protein shakes, vitamin shakes and daily vitamins. Um, for, I'll start with daily vitamins, you know, a multivitamin, can be supportive, um, especially kind of where we live in the world. Vitamin D um, is, you know, more likely that you'll be deficient, but not necessarily. So we recommend that you, you go to your doctor and you get the blood work done to see if you're deficient, because there's no reason to take, take a vitamin that your body doesn't need. You know, that, that, that's not going to, it's not like if we, we get extra of something, you know, we're going to be extra healthy. You know, our body can only use so much. Um, and the same goes for protein. Um, with our body only needs so much protein, we can't store it for tomorrow. And if we're taking in too much protein, it can be hard on our kidneys. Our kidneys have to work to to um, secrete that. Um, and if there's a lot of protein, it can it can hurt us. Um, so so protein shakes. If if you feel that um, you are, you know, depending on your activity level, you know, I would say protein shakes can, can be helpful. 
Um, and vitamin shakes, I'm not really, I don't, is, do you want to, is there something you could elaborate? I'm not really sure what like a vitamin shake would be. Sam. Yeah, I can just chime in a little bit more. Um, they have like the combinations, like high protein, the vitamin mix blend, um, kind of those generic type things. So I was just curious your thoughts on those. Okay. Um, like, uh, like an Adwala, like fruit shake that has added protein. Yeah. I mean, the Adwala ones, there's another brand I have on time it's called Orgain. Um, so there's, okay, I've yeah. heard of a lot of different ones, you know, some of them you make yourself, some other pre-made. Um, yeah. Yeah. You know, these, these are very individual and I, I think that if it's, you know, they're, they're convenient right? So being able to have something that's in a bottle and ready to go, um, but having them part of your diet, but making sure that you're, you're eating fresh or frozen foods, because often these vitamin shakes and protein shakes, they're missing fiber, right? So it's really only those foods that are going to have, um, have like a, a robust fiber content. And that's why most Americans aren't getting enough fiber, because um, the food is, um, is, is processed. And when we process foods, fiber, it's the first thing to go. Um, there are, first of all, two commendations to you for a wonderful presentation. And then someone is asking, um, they say someone recently diagnosed with colon cancer. Do you have any dietary recommendations? They are not currently in treatment yet. Hmm. Yeah, that's, that's a good question. And it's, it's really situational. Um, it's important to, um, to, to be, to be kind of gentle on your body at this point, right? So if, if this person is going to be um, undergoing uh, chemotherapy, or if there's going to be a resection, you know, understanding what's happening there, um, and decreasing fiber intake may be recommended at some point, because that roughage um, can be irritating. Um, so there, there's, it's hard to answer that, because there are kind of so many different factors we can take. So um, I think, I, I think that I'm going to leave it at that. Would you say that that person should speak with a nutritionist? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, and kind of setting up a plan. Um, you know, when we're, when we're going under, um, it's common for cancer patients to, to lose weight and they're at increased risk for, you know, malnutrition. So having a plan together of, of how you can meet your nutrient needs when your body is, you know, is fighting cancer. Um, so having a plan together is, is, is really helpful. So speaking to um, an outpatient dietitian, um, wherever, um, you know, uh, your insurance uh, makes that accessible if you have insurance. Okay, thank you for the question, Vinia. Any, Any other, other questions? No? Well, thank you, Sam, very much for a very informative lecture. Um, really appreciate you giving us uh, an overview of, you know, the type of diet to follow if you want to decrease your risk of colon cancer. Can, um, may I just say there is another question and it's from Patsy. Um, because of COVID-19, the vitamin zinc is highly recommended. Should everyone be taking it regardless of their health condition? Yeah, great question, Patsy. Um, so zinc um, is along with, you know, vitamin C is, is, is known for, for boosting our immunity. Um, but as I was saying, um, related to taking a multivitamin, if, if we're not deficient in a nutrient, um, there can actually be some you know, disadvantages, some harmful things from, from over taking vitamins and minerals. Um, so I would you know, recommend, you know, if, if you're considering it, that the best option is to, is to um, speak to your doctor, having that blood work done, um, 
because just just taking it to um, it, I I wouldn't recommend. Um, I have a question in reference to um, the recommendations about family members who may have had uh, colon cancer. Generally. Um, your doctor will ask you whether someone in the family has had it. And then yeah. they will uh, make recommendations about colonoscopies um, somewhat based upon that information. Is there anything we should know about that? Hmm. So if, if someone has a family history of colon cancer um, from a dietary perspective, well, you know, that would increase, you know, you're at increased risk, right? If there's, if there's a family history of it. So it's important to be aware of that. Um, and that makes, you know, following this colon cancer prevention diet, you know, really speak, uh, speak to you, um, hopefully maybe a little louder. Okay, did that, did that answer your question? It, 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 it addressed portions of it, um, okay. but essentially what you're saying is that doctors may um, uh, say to you that because of your family history, you need to have your colonoscopy sooner rather than later. Um, and that's, that's, I guess, what I was asking. About. Okay. You know, I think that's going to be maybe a better question for the next speaker. Okay. Um, around the, who, he's a doctor, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm just talking about the nutrition. So I, they might be a better, better able to answer that. Cause that's a great question. Okay. And um, I think we're going to move on though. Vanya has a question, generally speaking, less high protein diet with more and more fruits and vegetables, whole grains and dairy. And she's saying, is that what you're recommending? You got it, Vanya. You've been listening. Awesome job. And we are joined by our Dean, Dr. Lewis. Thank you for joining us. Okay. Okay. So I'll go ahead. Thank you again, Sam. And I'll go ahead and quickly introduce our next speaker, um, Mohammed Al Mikdadi. So Mohammed uh, received his MD degree from Jordan University and then went on to work as research assistants at Tufts while he was doing his residency in internal medicine. And he currently is a third year GI fellow at SUNY Downstate. And we have been working together for uh, the past two years on um, colon cancer disparities. And so um, Mohammed's gonna give us uh, a little bit of uh, science lesson uh, with regard to how we are attempting to address colon cancer disparities through research. So Mohammed, if you wanna share your screen. Thank you, Laura. Um, let me share my screen here. All right, can you see the screen? Yes. All right, great. Um, thanks, Laura, for the introduction. So um, I'm, I'm Mohammed al Makdadi, one of the GI fellows at SUNY Downstate. Um, so I've been working uh, with uh, Dr. Martella Roney, with our collaborator uh, from Cold Spring Harbor, uh, Dr. Samir Biaz. And uh, I'm going to just give you a little kind of overview about how we address um, these disparities in, in colon cancer and specifically the angle that we're looking at is we're looking at the influence of obesity um, on this disparity or on this uh, difference in colon cancer, specifically uh, in African-Americans. And so um, I'm sure you heard this before, but um, colon cancer in African-Americans, you know, when we're studying colon cancer in general, um, we see that the incidence uh, or, you know, the risk of getting colon cancer um, is different among different ethnic groups. And um, specifically, um, African-Americans seem to have a higher, a much higher risk 
uh, to developing colon cancer when we compare um, when we compare them to Caucasian Americans or even other ethnic groups. Um, and you can, you know, uh, a lot of studies had shown that, and um, this is kind of a well-known thing that um, African Americans, both men and women, uh, have higher uh, risk or incidence of developing colon cancer throughout their lives. Um, on top of that, we also see that uh, people who are um, uh, of African descent, Afri African Americans, they tend to be um, diagnosed at a later stage as well, which also affects um, their mortality or chances of dying from colon cancer. Again, when we compare that to other groups, we see that they, they tend to be diagnosed at a later stage, um, which uh, again will affect their mortality overall and five-year survival rates. And so they end up having a lower five-year sur survival rate when you compare it with um, Caucasian Americans, at least in, in these studies here. And so um, this all goes back to why is this, why is this happening? Is, is there an inherent risk um, for African-Americans or is there something else? Um, and to kind of answer this question, you need to look at the risk factors that Sam mentioned some of these risk factors, you know, having um, a you know, a specific dietary style, uh, which we call, you know, the Western diet, dietary pattern. Specifically, a diet with, with uh, a high fat diet um, has been shown to have higher risk of, of colon cancer. But also, um, obesity is one of the big ones. And we know that uh, obesity will increase uh, the risk of colon cancer. Uh, and so, when we look specifically at obesity, we also um, see that there is a disparity in terms of obesity. Obesity is one of the most prevalent diseases worldwide. Um, about 40%, more than 40% of Americans are obese. Um, but of, the, of those 40%, African Americans actually have um, one of the highest incidence of obesity when compared to other ethnic groups. Uh, and so, you know, the question always comes up, how does obesity even um, increase the risk of colon cancer? So just because you're obese doesn't, you know, why, why would that increase the risk of colon cancer? You're just accumulating more fat. Um, but to kind of understand that is you have to look at what is fat, and what, compose, what, is, what is it composed of? So fat is stored in our body in what we call adipose tissue. Um, and if you really look, kind of zoom in into these, this adipose tissue, you, you will see them, they look like little oil droplets stored all around the body. Um, and, you know, these are not just, I mean, they're there to store energy, their storage of, of kind of the excess energy that we have, but we also starting to realize that all this adipose tissue, all this fatty tissue around the body actually communicates with the rest of our body. It secretes different types of hormones that talks to other parts of the body and can even influence other cells and tell them what to do and what not to do. And so when you have kind of a healthy person who is not obese, um, they will have what we call a healthy adipose tissue. This is the adipose tissue that is not kind of bothered. It's just sitting there and not, it's not producing a lot of hormones, not communicating with everything in the body. But as you gain, um, as you gain more fat and you gain more weight, then you might end up with kind of um, more and more of this adipose tissue that tend to get inflamed and secrete all these kind of hormones. Um, and this kind of secretion of, of, of all these hormones end up kind of going to the rest of the body and increasing inflammation, kind of dis disturbing the immunity. Um, I'm sure you heard of how obesity can influence um, the patterns of COVID and how can it affects, you know, COVID mortality. And that all has to do with how obesity plays together with the immune system and how the kind of this inflamed adipose tissue can influence how our body reacts um, to different things. And specifically, you know, here, uh, we know that obesity also can influence how our body reacts to cancer. And so, um, there are many mechanisms that have been studied and shown that obesity can increase the risk of cancer um, via different ways. And so, 
you know, based on all that, um, based on what we know uh, about kind of specifically the African American population and and obesity and the risk of colon cancer, we try to formulate, we try to answer a question um, of, of uh, why or how does obesity increase the risk of colon cancer specifically in African Americans? Um, in in other words, you know. Um, we know that African Americans have higher risk of colon cancer, but we want to know how does obesity influence this risk specifically. And so, you know, it's a it's a complex question to answer, and uh, like all other research research questions, in order to answer uh, these kind of questions, you need to do some experiments, and to do some experiments, you need to kind of collect more data, and then finally. Um, get to the um, get to the answer or try to get to the answer at least. And so um, we kind of always when we have kind of a, a complex question like this, we try to break it down into multiple steps. And the first step of of uh, answering these kind of clinical questions or what we call basic science questions is is really to collect samples from the population that you're you're trying to study, and here um, we intended to collect um, samples from the tumor itself, from the colon cancer uh, itself, from people uh, from African American patients, and compare these tumor samples with. Caucasian Americans who also had colon cancer and try to kind of tease out the differences. Uh, and, uh, you know, we, we managed to do that actually in, um, in our lab. We collected, you know, we collected few samples, a little bit more than that, but the way we look at these samples or the way we uh, classify them is every sample we, we annotated with, you know, the gender, the sex, the age, um, uh, and then we also look at whether they're obese or not. Uh, so the, the, the indicator that we look at is something called the body mass index or the BMI, which differentiates between who or classifies who is considered to be obese and who is considered to be non-obese or normal. And we also look at where the colon cancer is. Is it on the right side of the colon, at, as Sam showed you that picture of the colon, or is it on the left side of the colon? And um, that sometimes can be different or can kind of influence the, the data that we're looking at. And so what do we do with these samples? Um, and uh, the way we compare um, and, and look at these samples to try to answer this question is we look at multi, multiple things, but we do what we call genetic comparisons. We do what we call protein expression comparisons. And then finally, something called epigenetic comparisons. I'm going to tell you briefly about this, but not too much. So what is a DNA or what is genetics? So when we talk about genetics or DNA, uh, DNA is essentially our genetic material. It's, what, it's the instructions in every cell to tell it um, what to do or how to function the way it should function. And the way the cell um, knows what to do um, is by transcribing this DNA by making these copies that I'm sure you heard about this a lot now called something called mRNA, which is kind of the final instruct or uh, um, to tell the cell how to build these little things that we call proteins. And proteins are just little simple building blocks that essentially make make us make make the rest of our body make. Um, build the rest of our body. It can be either inside the cell or outside the cell. It can be secreted. Um, there's a lot of different proteins. And so it all stems from DNA um, and then eventually becomes a protein based on this instruction. And so how about epigenetics? I mentioned something called epigenetics. Um, the way epigenetics work is, you know, even though you have this instruction um, to build all these kind of proteins and, you know, this really this one instruction is found in, the, in all of your body at the same quantity. So, um, you know, your eye cell and your brain cell and your colon cell have the same instructions, but why does, why does they, do they behave differently? And the reason why is because of this epigenetic kind of regulation. And this tells the cell, okay, you're a colon cell, this is what you should do. So this is kind of what epigenetics is, um, it's just, telling kind of the, the cells how to, what to deal, how to deal with all these DNA and what to express 
Um, and, you know, this, this has to do with, with what chromosomes are. So, you know, this instruction, this DNA is really found in the body as uh, in the cell as these really uh, tightly coiled um, little strands that uh, we call uh, chromosomes. They look like the X. And, you know, at the base, at the base of these, like if you really zoom in into these, they're really made up of very small little building blocks that we call nucleic acids. And these can be different flavors, you know, A, C, G, or T. Um, and um, I'll show you a little bit about them later. And so um, the first thing that we did is we did some genetic comparisons in our, in our samples. So we started looking at these samples that come from African-Americans and started comparing them with the samples coming from Caucasian-Americans. Um, and the way we look at this genetic um, kind of problem is to look if there is any DNA damage, any specific DNA damage um, in any specific parts of the DNA. And um, uh, remember I told you about this you know, ACGT, these are the little building blocks of the DNA that eventually um, give the instruction to build this sequence of, of protein or amino acids that eventually become proteins. And so what sometimes can happen is um, you can get uh, kind of a, a deletion of one of these. So one of these gets damaged and usually our, our bodies have some mechanisms to deal with this, to try to fix this problem. But if if for any reason this didn't get fixed, then you might end up with a damaged DNA. Uh, and so one of the first things that we did is we looked at the amount uh, of damaged DNA and the, and the different kind of genes that may be affected in these samples. Um, and we looked at these genes and we, uh, in these different samples, and we, we kind of um, segregated these samples into the African-Americans and then the Caucasian-Americans. And then we also looked at the normal uh, versus the obese um, to see if there are any kind of differences uh, between them. And again, indeed we did see some differences, but um, because our sample is still uh, little and we just started doing this, we're still not able to make any kind of big conclusions about this. But this is one of the ways that we study um, the genetic uh, the genetic problem. Uh, the other thing that we started doing is not just looking at what's already there, which is looking at the genetics or the epigenetics or or the proteins that are already there. The other thing that we started or wanted to do um, was uh, to use this um, new model, something called organoid. And a model essentially just means um, trying to simulate cancer in the lab or a model of anything, but a model of cancer is trying to simulate cancer in the lab. Um, and th the way that we used to do it or the way that it's really generally done in science is to get a, uh, a tumor sample from a patient. And we know this tumor sample is made up of these teeny tiny little building blocks called cells. And these cells um, usually in the tumor are just continuously dividing over and over again. And they don't stop because they don't have the normal mechanisms that tell the cell to stop. And so we get those cells and we um, dissociate them, we suspend them in, in, in liquid, and then we place them on a plate just like this. And the cells start dividing and they cover the bottom of the plates. And these cells are essentially the same cells that come from the cancer. Um, and that's how we study them. We look how they behave. We do some experiments on them. Um, but again, you might have kind of see an issue in this and or a lot of people saw an issue in this. And the issue is that this is kind of a two dimensional grid of cells. And really, when you think about it, cancer inside the body, colon cancer or other cancers, does not grow as a sheet of cells. It's, you know, cancer is not just like one little paper, uh, like, like a sheet of paper growing inside the body. It has a structure. It has a, a three-dimensional structure. And so can we replicate that kind of structure in the lab? And the answer is yes, we can. And the way we do it is by this little kind of new tool that we have now called organoids. Um, and this is kind of how they look like. They're a three-dimensional um, cell culture. 
Uh, and you know, if you kind of dissect an organoid, this is specifically a, a colon organoid or um, something coming from the GI tract, then you see it's, it's made up of these little, little building block called cells, and then they form into a kind of a 3D structure or a little kind of a cyst um, that's, that grows in this kind of a, a bubble of, of, um, of gel-like material kind of simulates what happens in the body. Um, and so we started looking at these and, and the way we make these is very similar to the way that I showed you, we make these sheets of cells that we call cell lines. Um, the way we make these is we get either normal tissue or even tumor tissue like from colon cancer. And then we suspend them in this kind of a, a, a bubble um, of, of gel that solidifies. And then they start growing inside by giving them the right, hormones or the right signals, they eventually grow and they make these 3D structures that we can look at under the microscope and, and take pictures of. And so what is the importance of all this? Like, why are we doing, um, why are we going through all the trouble to, to make these in the lab? Well, um, the, the, the good thing about these is that you can um, have as many as, as you want of them and they grow pretty quickly. And these cells are the same cells. They have the same genetic material. They have the same proteins, epigenetics, everything that we talked about that the patients have. And so whatever the cells do, we assume is gonna happen also in the patients. And um, because they are growing in what a 3D um, environment, they kind of resemble more of the original um, tumor or the original place they came from than just a sheet of cells. And so we do a whole bunch of things with them. We can, you know, just keep them in the culture and see how they grow. We can also do the genetic profiling on them. Um, one of the exciting things um, about working with them is actually doing what we call high throughput drug screening, which means we can get a colon cancer sample and grow it in the lab in this form and then test different um, drugs on it and see which one works the best, which one kills it the best. Um, and so a lot of people are looking into that. And I'll show you what we, uh, what we are doing with them. But one of the important things is that this kind of research or this kind of um, culture had been kind of well known for a while now, well established for a few years, at least 10 years or so. But it hadn't really been applied um, in different ethnic groups. Most, the majority of this population either comes from the Asian population in Japan and Asian countries or from Caucasian Americans. Um, and so one of the efforts that we started doing is trying to um, get all these samples and, and store it so we can have a, what we call a biobank of these organoids of the African-American population or uh, uh, patients of African descent. And so this is one of the things that, that we've been working on um, that may contribute not now, but perhaps later to, to kind of more studies and more things. And this is just an example of, of you know, what I told you is, you know, you dissociate the cells, you put them in this, um, in this kind of bubble of, of gel. And then, you know, after four days, they, you start seeing these little, um, uh, or what we call organoids, you know, baby organoids, and then eventually they grow to, to become really, um, really kind of big, mature organoids. And this is one of our samples that, are, that is growing from um, a colon cancer sample from uh, an African American. And so one of the things that we can compare is, is just looking at these cells and, and see how these cells grow um, differently, if there's any differences in the way they grow, in the shape they form, because that can also give us some more information or more kind of data points to try to tease out differences. And so, you know, we did compare the African-American versus the Caucasian-American organoids and how, how they grow. And, and so far, we haven't seen really, at least looking at them, any differences by just looking, by just observing. And so um, we can do a lot of cool stuff with these organoids. And um, one of the things that we do is, is we do some, my, some mouse experiments. And, um, you know, again, um, remember we, we, we said that just growing them in the lab, even though they're in a 3D environment, it still does not fully resemble them growing in a patient. Because for example, a colon cancer 
um, is essentially a cell that started dividing over and over again from the colon, growing in the colon, and then eventually becomes this kind of big mass. And this is what we call colon cancer. Um, and so just growing it in the lab in, in a synthetic gel uh, maybe doesn't do it justice as it wouldn't, it might not behave the way it would behave when it, it was in the patient. And so to kind of try to mimic that is uh, to take this, this collection of 3D cells and try to transplant them uh, into the mice. Uh, and we try to put them specifically in the colons of mice. So we do little uh, mouse colonoscopies um, and we take these uh, little collection of cells and then we inject them into, into uh, the first layer of the colon inside the mouse. And then, you know, they stay there and eventually they become part of the, of the colon and then they grow um, as tumors in the colon as they should, as they do in real life. Um, and so these are just some pictures of, of, the, of, the, of the tumors that we grew. So this, this is just a picture from inside the colon and showing that there is, um, now this little bump growing right here. And this little bump, um, or here you see it better, a bigger bump after four weeks, it becomes bigger. Um, this is essentially colon cancer. That's human colon cancer uh, that we grew in the lab that's growing in the mouse. And this allows us to do a lot of different experiments because now you have a really nice you know, model that is very close to reality. You're simulating colon cancer really almost, you know, as it happens in human. And then you can also do a whole lot of experiments, including drug therapy experiments or um, to try to see how it reacts, you know, um, uh, to different kind of drugs or different diets uh, and, and see what happens. And so this is just kind of a busy slide, but again, just to show you that um, we do eventually take these out and then we look at them um, under the microscope and then we see, we compare them to the original tumor. So for example, this is a comparison between this transplanted tumor and then the original tumor that it came from originally uh, that we grew in the lab. And then, and we see that is, it is very similar um, and we can actually prove that it's, it's the same. Um, based on how it looks like genetically and, and how different proteins are expressed. Um, and then uh, the last thing that we also wanted to do is to, um, to try to look at the immune system and metabolism. Um, and the reason is the immune system um, is, is very important in, um, in the development of cancer because your immune system uh, generally protects you from developing cancers. Remember, we talked about how this DNA can get damaged at any point, um, but uh, what stops it or what fixes it um, is either you can fix the DNA or you can look at the cell that got damaged and then the immune system, the immune cell comes in and says, this is a bad cell and it, it, you know, it kills it. And so if you have a weak immune system, um, generally you are at higher susceptibility to developing colon cancer or any cancer, any cancer for that matter. Um, and so, you know, the, the way we look at these, uh, the way we look at these uh, immune interactions is by looking at these immune markers. And these immune markers are essentially just uh, signals between the immune cells. So different immune cells, you heard about white blood cells, um, different types of, of, of blood cells, they interact with each other um, by sending these signals inside the blood. So they, they send a signal inside the blood to tell, to kind of recruit, to tell other immune cells to come over or, or so. Um, and by looking at these different uh, markers, these different signals, um, we may be able to, to tell something about the differences between um, African-Americans and Caucasian-Americans with colon cancer. And we may be able to explore how obesity influences these signals. Because we know obesity also, the fat cells also secrete their own hormones and signals. And so we, 
in, in one of our studies, we already looked at the differences between African Americans and Caucasian Americans with colon cancer in terms of these signals. And we saw there is differences in few of them. And so we decided to also look at them in, in kind of the setting of obesity to see if obese African Americans versus normal African Americans are different from obese Caucasian Americans and normal Caucasian Americans. Um, and we're still kind of, this is still a work in progress, but we're beginning to see some sort of a pattern um, um, that we haven't really made any conclusions about yet. But these are some of the comparisons that we, we look at when we study the immune system. And then finally, um, there is this thing called metabolomics or metabolism or metabolic research. And really, you know, again, we talked about the chromosome level and then you have the DNA and then you get the mRNA and then finally you get the proteins. But then at the end of the day, the proteins um, uh, also can kind of work on these little what we call metabolites. And this is essentially the most basic structures that we have. And this includes, you know, the lipids, includes the carbohydrates that you eat um, that end up in the blood, um, includes a, a whole set of different uh, kind of little either hormones or little uh, substances that are circulating in our blood. There's a whole bunch of them. And uh, looking at these, the different levels of these in the blood is really what we call metabolomics research. And trying to see if there is any signature metabolites um, that can differentiate between different groups or can be either high or low in different set of people. And so um, it's very, you can tell, you know, by how many metabolites, we have thousands and thousands of metabolites inside, inside our blood. Uh, and so really you can't just pick and choose, uh, but instead what we do is we test a lot of them. We choose 100 or 200 to test. And then, you know, we send our samples and then you get a, you get a, you know, you get some data that looks something like this. Um, again, this is very complicated to look at even, even for the senior researchers. Um, but uh, essentially what this shows is that um, every sample has its own amount of, um, of these metabolites. It's either high which is either kind of red or it's low, it's kind of blue. Um, and then it's up to us, the researcher, to kind of look at different ones and see if there is any of these that can make, um, that, that, that is truly different between the groups um, that may give us an idea about what really is happening or what might be influencing this change. And so, you know, we can look at some of them and again, we classify this into obese versus normal, African-American versus Caucasian-American. And then we see um, differences in different things. For example, here we look at the amino acid called histidine and we see some differences. Again, here we look at arginine and again, we see some differences. Um, and so uh, the reason we look at all this is that there have been some studies showing that different levels of metabolites are different from, um, uh, you know, um, colon cancer to colon cancer. Like for example, one that comes on the right might have a different signature than one that comes on the left. Um, and so we're trying to tease out this difference in uh, African-Americans and Caucasian-Americans in, in kind of the setting of obesity. It, how does obesity really influence all that? Because we know that obesity increases or at least disturbs the amount of these metabolites um, in, in the blood. And so this is kind of a, a glimpse about uh, some of the research that, that, that uh, we've been doing in, in obesity in African-Americans and colon cancer. And I'd like to thank all our, you know, the, the, the people who helped us. Well, first the mice that <laughs> really we, 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 uh, we use for our uh, scientific purposes and all the people that, uh, that helped, helped me with the research. And um, I'll take any questions if anybody has. So far, we don't have any questions. We do have uh, someone left a message for you that this has been a great presentation and that the information is being shared with members of the National Association of uh, University Women to help educate the Black community. So Mohammed, I actually had a, a question. Can you uh, maybe just give a brief explanation how 
the human cancer is able to develop in mice? So uh, the way that the human cancer is able to develop in mice is, um, you know, uh, usually if you, you know, if you transplant a human cell into a, um, into a mouse, um, it's not really, it's not really going to survive because the mouse has its own immune system and it's going to recognize that this, um, uh, this cancer cell is, is, well, this cell is not mouse, it's human. So right away, the immune system of the mouse is going to destroy it. Um, and so what we do is we actually get very specific type of mice um, that are immunodeficient. They, they, they essentially lack immunity um, against anything pretty much. And so they are able, we keep these mice in very, very, very well-maintained, you know, quarantined, very clean facilities. Um, so they don't get an infection, um, but um, they're, they're, they can't really develop rejection to the cancer that we kind of place when we do our uh, transplants. And, and uh, again, this, this shows you that, you know, there's different creative ways in science to try to um, solve this problem. Um, again, one of the solution of this problem is actually to get a mouse, um, what we call desensitized um, to human cells. So to, to get the mouse to, to kind of make the immune system of the mouse since birth be accustomed to human cells and eventually you know, the mouse immune system will be okay with having human cells inside the body. And that's what we call it humanized uh, mice. So these are different ways that we can do it. I don't know if that answers the question, Laura. Yes, no, that's perfect. Uh, one of the other questions I had was regarding uh, the use of these organoids for drug screening. Do you think with, you know, the advent of personalized medicine that in the future, you know, these drug screening assays may be able to provide some guidance to uh, oncologists um, in maybe not first line therapy, but second line therapy for cancer patients. Yes, yeah, that's a great question, Laura. Absolutely. I mean, um, one of the kind of the premise of having these, the, of having the organoid model because it resembles the original cancer so closely, um, a lot of people have started looking into these uh, drug screens, into looking at different chemotherapies. Um, and again, as I, as I showed you, what's nice uh, about these cultures is that they are pretty, not just simple to, to, to make, but also they grow pretty fast. Um, and you saw after you know, 16 days only, so in two weeks, we have a full-blown culture that we can test all sorts of therapies on. Um, and so you can imagine a world where, you know, you just get either a biopsy or, or a little piece of tissue from the colon cancer and then expand it in the lab. And then within, you know, a month or so, you can have a list of what potentially may work for this specific patient, just based very specifically on their specific tumor and their genetic buildup. Um, and so that's, I think that's an exciting kind of part of the organoid research and it's, it's a great, um, it's, it's a great uh, premise and kind of end goal that we may reach. Dean Allen Lewis has a question. Sure. Thank you. Very nice presentation. I want to go back to something you mentioned earlier, um, Mohammed, which was the, um, the concept of epigenetics. And I'm not a physician, so I, I don't fully understand that. But my sort of lay understanding of epi epigenetics is that it really is the impact of behavior and the environment on how one's genes work. And so I guess, clarify this if you would, you were talking about, I guess, the environmental influences at the more cellular level. Is that what you were, when you, is that how you were looking at that? How you so, in that context? Yeah, so uh, thanks, thanks for the question. So epigenetics is, again, it's a pretty kind of broad term and it essentially describes any um, influence of, um, of, of anything really, whether it's intrinsic from our own bodies or right. whether it's environmental, whether the food we eat, obesity or anything else, how these factors influence the DNA expression itself. Gotcha. Uh, 
And so, yeah, so like different uh, foods that we eat or different metabolites that we have in our body, um, different hormones might uh, kind of talk to the DNA and, and tell it to express different proteins in different ways, uh, just based on, on its mere presence. Gotcha. Um, and that's kind of the, what epigenetics is. Yeah, okay. Gotcha. That, that clarifies it. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah. Very nice. Thank you. Any other questions? I just had one follow up question. Um, I was thinking ab about the uh, DNA mutations that you were speaking about. And with, um, you know, new targeted therapies being becoming available, you know, what would seem like on a regular basis these days, um, you know, is, is this information then potentially going to be helpful to also, in addition to the drugs, uh, guide, you know, patient treatments? Yeah, uh, good question, Laura. Uh, so these different mutations, um, when we look at these mutations, so when we say mutation, it just says that there is a damage in a specific gene that, you know, eventually should have been a protein that performs a specific function in the cell. And so some of these proteins um, essentially tell the cell, hey, stop dividing. Um, you're, you're, you know, you're doing it too much. And so when you have a problem in these genes, when you have a mutation that stops these genes from functioning, then that, um, again, that's a problem that may end up in cancer. One of the big ones is that we know is something called a gene called APC is, is one of the genes that work that way. But there are other genes that essentially um, work the opposite way is they tell the cell to divide. But what happens in cancer is that these genes get, um, you know, get either they're accumulating, there's too much of them, or they're working too much. Um, and so these are the type of genes, or these are the type of proteins that sometimes they're a targeted therapy for, is the ones that um, are overexpressed, they're working too much. And so you can develop, a, you can imagine developing a drug that tells this specific protein to kind of, you know, chill out. Um, and that might help kind of reducing the, the, the speed that cancer um, is, is uh, uh, replicating. And so the organoid model or like our models definitely can help in, in, in looking at that because again, the genetic, the material that we get from the, that the patient, the sample that we get from the, uh, uh, from the patient and then we grow in the lab has these same mutations that the patient has. And so when we try a medication or a chemotherapy in the lab, um, it should reflect whatever is going to happen in the patient's body. So definitely even the targeted mutations can, uh, even the targeted therapies can probably benefit from this kind of research. Great, any other questions? Pam, you have a question? No, thank you. Yeah, thank you everybody for listening. Yeah, so Mohammed, thank you very much for giving us a science lesson into how, you know, uh, we are working with Culturing Harbor to address colon cancer disparities by not only uh, creating uh, research models that are not available, so there's no way for us to truly study uh, these research questions without first the research models, but then following up um, with these additional studies, um, the gene mutations, the metabolomics, um, looking at the cytokines. And you know, in the end, we're gonna try to combine all this information to try to determine whether or not there are uh, distinct differences that could be playing a role in our case uh, in relation to obesity and colon cancer. Well, thank you very much for everyone attending uh, this second um, community lecture. Uh, we apologize for the technical diff difficulties initially. Um, this is, um, you know, what we deal with, with doing 
these kind of uh, non in person uh, lectures, but the hope is that this will be an annual event and that we will be in person come the fall uh, next year. So we have one final uh, community lecture in this series uh, that is going to be focused on pancreatic cancer. And that lecture um, is on November 10th. And we hope to see you there.